you have your uh, your Bibles with you, turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 3. If you have your Bibles with you, we'll have it up on the screen for you. 1 Samuel chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Page 397 in my Bible. That won't help me much right away. Wouldn't that be cool if it was? Anyway, so. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. Catch this now. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. <laughs> the lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel. Samuel answered, here, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call you, go back and lay down. So he went and, and lay down. Again the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son Eli he said, I did not call you, go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel a third time and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. Then Eli realized it was the Lord calling the boy. So he told Samuel, go and lie down. If, if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and laid down in his place. The Lord came and stood there calling as the other time, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. The word of our Lord. We do thank you, God, for this day, for this opportunity to come in and worship you, for you are good and you are worthy. And today we offer you all of our praise. We pray now, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would have its way in here, that your Holy Spirit would rest down upon all of us, opening us up, our eyes, our ears, our minds, our hearts. And we pray as we always do, Lord, that you would speak for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Uh, mom, mom was a single parent. I was, I was eight years old when mom, mom took us, the, the three kids, and, and uh, we, we, we left dad. And, and, and mom, mom did an outstanding job raising three kids. Uh, Mom worked three jobs often. Uh, my, my brother kind of helped raise us, and, and uh, Mom, Mom was always always working to give us the things that we needed. We, we never went without. Uh, we, we had a small two-bedroom apartment. My brother and I shared a room. My sister had a room. And then Mom slept in the living room on a pull-out couch. She still has the back pain today that went along with that pull-out couch. But, but every single week, Mom had us kids, and she got up, and she was tired, and she probably didn't feel like it, but she had us in church every single week. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday nights, children's events, youth events as we got older, Mom made sure that we were in church. Every night, the three of us would crowd around Mom there in that pull-out couch, and Mom would crack open her Bible, and we would begin to do devotions together, and we would pray together there in her makeshift bedroom. M Mom, Mom was a connecting point between God and us. There are five very powerful, meaningful, extraordinary birth stories in the Bible. The first one you know is Abram and Sarai. As God goes to Abram and Sarai and he's making covenant with them and, and he says, you're going you're gonna to bear children and, and they're going to be as many as a, just, just a ton of kids and all of this and Sarai was barren and, and they just couldn't, couldn't believe. They were 100 years old 
that God steps in and God blesses them with a child. Another one is Moses. You know Moses is a great leader who was God's instrument in making God's people God's people as as the whole exodus happens and and the story of God moving through God's people. But before this, Moses was a baby sent down the Nile River in a basket, saved from the hands of death. Then there's Zechariah and Elizabeth who were told they were going to have a baby even though Elizabeth was barren, but the angel of the Lord comes and says, you're going to have kids, and and Zechariah didn't believe, but as as soon as he could speak again, as soon as Elizabeth gives birth, Zechariah speaks and names him John, John the Baptist. And then there's kind of a famous one. (laughs) You may have heard this one before. There was a virgin lady, Mary, and an angel comes and speaks to Mary and says, you're going to have a child, you're going to name him Jesus, and he is going to Save the world. For these very, very famous birth stories in Scripture, miraculous, they, they are the foundation of our past and, and our story. There's one, one more that ranks right up there. The story of Samuel. Elkanah was, was a man that had two wives, and one of them's name was Hannah, and, and, and the other one was, was Peniah, and, and, and she could have children, but Hannah could not. And Hannah, year after year, was teased by Peniah. It was very sad. And then one day she goes to the temple, and she begins to pray. And she cries out to the Lord so, so much, and she's praying just face down, and she's just given over in prayer, and so much so that Eli comes out, and Eli thinks, well, somebody's drunk. And he comes up, and she says, I'm not drunk. She says, I'm just crying out to God for this child. And she says, she makes this this deal with God. She, She begs God, she says, if you will give me this child, as she's pouring out to God, she says, I'll give him back to you in service. The Lord gives her a child, and she names it Samuel, which means I beg the Lord. Samuel becomes a great leader. He becomes a judge. People come to him, come to him for his advice and his judgment. He becomes an anointer of kings. He becomes this super important person, a prophet of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord lived in him, and he was a great, great leader. We we'll continue our sermon series, Kingdom Life. And if you haven't found, if you haven't realized this yet, what we're what we're talking about in the series is is focusing on identity, who who we're called to as kingdom people, because we realize that that we're not called to have just this individual personal relationship that's boxed in, boxed in, just me and Jesus here. But within this kingdom life that we're called to, we are called to dance together. That we're called to be koinonia together, that we, we live together, we share together, we, we do life together. We, we talked about the fact that we're called to pray big, that we're called to, to, to reach out to God and understand who God is. God's not a, a genie in a bottle or, or a magic uh, fairy that just gives us everything to make us happy, but God does desire that we come to him and, and we spend that time with him and we pray and we realize that the kingdom of God comes when we're lined up in prayer with God. We talk about surrender and sacrifice. And how as a people of God, we are called to be given over that we are called to be surrendered people, and we don't surrender very well in our culture today. But the calling of the, the person living within this kingdom life is to be surrendered and sacrificed before God. Not this person that just tries to achieve, 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 climb the ladder. But the calling of the Christ follower is one who is surrendered. <clears throat> Jesus said, I have not come to be served. To serve. We talked about the, the calling to be perfect in love last week. This, this calling to, to realize that we are doing the job that we are intended to do. We are living as people lined up for the kingdom. We are the arrow that is on the way to the bullseye when we are living in love. Loving 
even enemies. This is, this is our identity. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, these are things that we cannot pick and choose from. This is the life of the follower of Jesus. This, this is kingdom life. I want you to think for just a moment this morning about that person that was instrumental in you coming to a personal relationship with Christ. Just, just take a quick moment. I want you to picture their face. Pick, picture their name this morning. That, that person or people who were instrumental in, in connecting you with God. Maybe it was a Sunday school teacher. Maybe it was a children's pastor, or a youth pastor, or a pastor, or a, a parent. Who was that bridge in your life? That bridge in your life that connects you, connected you to the Father. I actually had a few people. Mom, mom was a bridge in our lives, all of us kids. And I had youth pastors, I had mentors, pastor friends, and but, but a couple stand out in my life as, as those that, that, that connected me with God. So two that were, were, were bridges for me. My brother Darren was a bridge for me. Darren had a solid relationship with Christ as, as a young man in our youth group. He, he was one of the leaders always in our youth group. He was always studying scripture. He was always uh, doing the things that he should do. Darren's relationship with Christ only got deeper and deeper as he went to Tribeca and, and he studied to be a pastor and he went to seminary. Darren, as long as I can live, as long as, long as I can remember, lived his life for Jesus Christ. And he always pointed me to Jesus. Even during those years that I wasn't the model Christian. Darren lived pointing me to Christ. I can say this morning without a, a shadow of a doubt, I would not be the person I am today. I would not be a pastor if, if it wasn't for Darren's Christ-like influence on my life, his, his connecting in my life. Who, who is that person for you? Think about them. I want you to picture them this morning. Another was Jeff Stark. Last week I told a story about running with, with Pastor Jeff and, and, and how he gave up. I did it. Um, in case he watches the video. <laughs> I was called to ministry under Pastor Jeff, and, and uh, Jeff, Jeff was very instrumental in, in our testimony and in, in us coming to Christ. And uh, Jeff, Jeff was was our teacher. I was discipling us as I was called in the ministry, and, and, and Jeff allowed me to come in and shadow him and, 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 and learn from him. And Jeff invested in my life. He, he, he poured into me time that pastors just don't have. Jeff gave of that time and poured himself into me. Who, who was your Jeff? Who was your Darren? Who is your Eli? In our scripture this morning, Eli was that influence on Samuel's life. Eli was the, was the mentor, the, the leader. And, and um, our scripture says that, again, in those days, the word of the Lord was rare. In, in, other, in other words, um, not many were hearing from God. And Samuel did not understand, did not know, did not recognize the word of the Lord, yet. So we get this picture in our scripture that Samuel's over here in the temple and Eli's in, in his room and, and, and God calls out Samuel. Of course, Eli's getting old and, and uh, Eli's having a hard time. So Samuel is probably just as important to Eli as Eli is to Samuel. They had that relationship. And Samuel gets up and he makes his way over to where Eli is. And he comes in and he says, yes, what's wrong? You called me. And Eli says, I didn't call you. You're hearing things. Go back and lay down. So Samuel makes his way back, and he's got to be thinking, I know I, I, know I heard him. 
He makes his way back. He lays back down in the temple again. God calls out to Samuel, but he doesn't recognize the voice of God. So Samuel jumps up again. He makes his way back across. He comes to where Eli is. He says, yes, Eli, I know at this time you called me. And Eli says, I didn't call you, boy. Go lay down. Leave me alone. I need my sleep. So Samuel walks back again, and he's got to just be wondering, well, what's going on? He goes back, and he lays down, and again, God calls out Samuel. And he gets up, and he makes his way back there again. I know that I heard it this time. And he opens up, and he says, Eli, you, you called. And Eli realizes right about now, this is God. But Samuel cannot hear the voice of the Lord yet. So Eli speaks into Samuel's life and he says, next time when you hear this, this is God calling upon you. Say, speak, Lord. Your servant's listening. And so Eli, Samuel goes back and he lays down and again, God calls and God says, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel says, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. And this is, this is the moment where Eli has connected the God of the universe with Samuel, who couldn't yet hear his voice. Samuel didn't yet recognize the voice of the Lord. The, the voice of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him, but Eli recognized it. Eli understood it, and Eli became a bridge between the Lord and Samuel. He stood in between God and Samuel. He became a connection. Who was your connection? Who, who was that person that stood between you and God and connected you for the very first time? At the count of three, I, I want you to call out their first name. You've been picturing that person. You know that person. Their name is on the tip of your tongue. At the count of three, we're going to call out that person's name. One, two, three. Without that connection, without that bridge, you most likely wouldn't be the person that you are today. Without Eli being that bridge to Samuel, biblical history may have been much different. Without Darren and Jeff in my life, I would not be standing at this pulpit today. Can you hear me now? Who in years to come might sit in a service like this today and call out your name. I'm going to ponder a question this morning. Why do you come to church? Why do you specifically come to Sandusky Community Church of the Nazarene? I, um, I, I went online and, and, and I, I looked up the top answers that people give for why they go to church. The top answers given for, for why they attend where they attend. Are you ready for this? Uh, it's where my family went. I like the preaching. The worship fits me. <clears throat> The building is geographically convenient for me. I am dating a member. <laughs> hey, it gets you to church, right? I like the number of attenders. The people are nice to me. Did you notice something about all of these answers, a commonality with them? They're all... About me. All of the answers are about what I get. What I what I what I receive. 
don't, don't hear me wrong. I, I love our worship here. Pastor Kathleen is super talented, the, the worship team, and I'm excited about where the, the where the worship is going to be going, and I love to fill up the stage with a full choir. We talked about that. I'm super excited about our worship. I, the building is geographically convenient. I love the building. I, I show it off every, every chance that I get. I believe that the people here are nice. But, and hear me, if you come to church for what you get, then you're coming for the wrong reasons. Is that okay? Week five, can I stomp on toes that hard? <laughs> if you come to church for what you receive, then, then, then you're coming for, for the wrong reasons, the right reason. The only reason to be a part of the body of Christ is to advance the kingdom of God. Somebody say amen. 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 And you're, you're going to, again, as we journey together, as I'm your pastor, and we, we live life together, we share in life together, you're going to hear me talk a lot about being anti-individual Christianity. The, 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 having a personal relationship is great, church, but it can't stop there. That we are called together. We are called to be together. It's this picture we get in Acts chapter 2 of the church, the church that the Spirit birthed. It's God we talked about earlier. God breathes the, the breath of life. That Ruah is the same thing in, in, in the Greek, in the New Testament. It's the pneuma. It's the breath, the spirit, the life of God that is breathed into the people. And the church is birthed. The church happens. These, all these people come together and they share together and they pray together and they take care of each other and they are together. This beautiful picture of together. The church in Acts 2 could be retitled together. This, this beautiful picture of what God desires for the church to be. Let me just tell you, individual Christianity by itself, this consumer mentality inside the church is harmful to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. It, it does damage within the kingdom of Jesus Christ. The kingdom life is not about being a consumer, but about being a contributor. Let me say that one more time. That's the most important thing you're going to hear today. The kingdom of Jesus Christ is not about being a consumer, but it's about being a contributor. Be being a part. Someone was advancing the kingdom of God when they became a bridge between you and the Lord. Darren and Jeff advanced the kingdom of God when they were a bridge between me and the Lord. And if there is one thing that, that I want said about me when I retire, when I'm, when I'm dead and gone one day, it's not going to be that he was a good preacher. It's not going to be he was a good friend. It's not going to be he was, he was a good pastor. What I want, what I desire to be said about me one day when I'm long gone is that I was a bridge. That, that I, was, I was an Eli for somebody. What we're talking about this morning is standing in the gap being a connecting point between the God of the universe and somebody. There's another person in history that was a bridge from God to man, one who stood between God and you on your behalf, and aren't you glad that he did? Jesus was a bridge. We talked about this a few weeks ago with the setup of the temple and, and the ark of God, that the presence of God, uh, that that housed God's presence was in, was in this room, the most holy place, and there was this massive curtain that separated the holy of holies and the most holy place. And once a year, the high priest would go in and offer up prayers on behalf of God's people and it would be holy and pleasing to God. That was, that was the desire. 
But as Jesus dies, he breathes his last breath and he dies there on the cross. This separation, this curtain that separated the people and God rips from the top to the bottom. And now Jesus becomes the bridge that connects God to man. Jesus was the bridge. And I, you're going to hear me say this a lot. Jesus is our Lord, but not just our Lord. Jesus, Jesus is the Messiah, but not just the Messiah. Though. Jesus, Jesus is God in flesh, but not just that. Jesus is also our model. That that teaches us and shows us how to live. And Jesus was this bridge. Let me tell you, church, you are called to be a bridge. You are called to stand in the gap for someone. You are called to be an Eli to someone. When we, when we just live within this box of individual Christianity, it's about me and it's about God. It's about God, it's about me. It's about me getting my ticket stamped to God and, and just being, being this, this person all by myself here. We live without, we live outside of the understanding of who Christ has called us to be. We are called to be an Eli. And let me just tell you, church, you're also called to continually be a Samuel. Be someone who is connected to someone else, someone who is a mentor, a guide, a leader, someone who will point to Christ to you throughout your life. Who's your Eli? Who's your Samuel? Who's Samuel?